Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. And I just want to welcome everyone to Preserving Your Family Treasures. I want to welcome those of you who are in class today and those of you who are watching online. We do have a few housekeeping things to go over first before we get started and before I introduce myself. Um, if you could just please turn off your cell phones or silence your cell phones at this time. If you have questions, and um, just because it's easier for people to hear you because you're wearing masks and for our on online folks, if you have questions and could come over to this microphone to ask your questions, that would be great. Or if you cannot do that or don't want to do that, I will try to repeat those questions um, so everyone can hear them and for our online um, folks as well. If you're online, and you have questions, you can email lifelonglearning at wichita.edu, which you see on the screen right now. And because I want to include our online um, students as well, as much as we can, this class does have some interactive components to it. So I would like to also include um, our online friends too. All right, so, um, I do need to read this per university. It's kind of a new update on our mask policy for speakers. Per latest university guideline, instructors presenting on stage do not need to wear a mask or face covering. Yay, so you can hear me better. Students and visitors must wear face coverings over their mouths and noses while on all Wichita State University campuses, in all hallways, public spaces, classrooms, and other common areas of campus buildings. So basically, you guys have to wear masks everywhere. So, all right. So I would like to introduce myself. My name is Rochelle Meineke. And I am the director of the Lowell D. Holmes Museum of Anthropology at Wichita State. The uh, Lowell D. Holmes Museum was started by Dr. Holmes in the mid-60s to be a teaching museum, to teach students how to care for artifacts, how to um, set up exhibits and design exhibits. It teaches them how to do all the paperwork, but it also functions as an actual museum. So we do take donations and we do have uh, loans and we do educational programmings, we do tours. So I would invite you to come and visit uh, the museum in Neff Hall. This is the perfect time to come to campus because you can find parking anywhere. There's not as many people. So, um, cause we are kind of, Neff Hall's kind of in the middle of campus. So it's a little, um, there's, there's no just parking lot right close to it, but um, you can find parking just about anywhere now. So I would invite you to come. We're open one to five. Uh, Monday through Friday or by appointment. Um, I also am the coordinator of our museum studies certificate. It is a graduate certificate where students get it along with their master's degree or they can get it along with um, just as a standalone certificate. And so we have students that are wanting to go into the museum field or we have people that are in the museum field and just want to um, hone their skills a little bit and learn a little bit more. And I teach two of those classes, um, part of which you're going to get a little bit today. So, and then um, I'm also the curator of the Pizza Hut Museum. If you've been to the Pizza Hut Museum on campus or heard about that, it opened about three years ago. And, um, and I was on the committee that helped plan that and put that together. So another museum, perfect time to come and visit campus because parking is available. Um, that museum has been open by appointment only, and I'm not 100% sure if it's it's been open eight to five prior to coronavirus, and I'm not exactly sure. So it'd be, probably be good to call before you came um, to that museum. Prior to my position at Wichita State, I was the director of the Augusta Historical Museum, and I'm still on the board there and involved with things in the community. I live in Augusta with my husband and two kids who are both college students at Wichita State uh, this semester. So we are gonna go ahead and get started. Yes. That's a good question, I'll find that for you. <laughs> Um, if you call the, if you look up the Marcus Welcome Center at the front desk, 
they are the ones that are managing the museum and that is you would call the Marcus Welcome Center and I'm sorry I don't have that number off the top of my head but she asked um, what number that you call for to find out information about the Pizza Hut Museum. I have to remember to repeat questions. <laughs> So just a few things to get started, and we'll just briefly go over this. And some of you may already know, um, and I know it's, it's hard to see, but I just wanted you to have the information. We'll just go over it briefly. Those of you, some of you have taken um, several lifelong learning courses. Some of you, this may be your only one or first one. So I just wanted to let you know how to um, check your email or to get on Blackboard and things that instructors might be using. Um, you probably won't need to. I will probably put our readings on here, but you also, um, and if you didn't pick up the uh, readings for next week, they're on the uh, table back here. And those of you online should be getting those via Dropbox, I believe. Yes. Okay. So if you go, if you type in to Google my WSU, it should take you to Wichita State. Now make sure it doesn't take you to Washington State because they are also WSU. So, or you can go to the Wichita State University website and then just Google my WSU and it will take you to this page. Oops, let me back up here. This is where, um, you will set up your password. So those of you who are in this class, everyone has a MyWSU ID. Some of you may have already been given a, a WSU um, email, and some of you chose not to, and that's perfectly fine. But this is what it looks like. You just put in your WSU, it'll ask for a password, and then it will give you a series of um, security questions to go through. And then it'll look like this. And you can't tell because it's tiny and that's okay. But um, this is what your page looks like and it has a whole lot of information on there that you probably don't even need. But at the very top are some icons and it will show you how to um, click on the, your email. And this is where it's a little weird. Um, I think it's, it's odd because you have your MyWSU email, which all of you would have a shockers.wichita.edu email, but that's not what you type in. You put in your MyWSU um, ID at wichita.edu and your password, and that will take you to your email. And then if you want um, instructors at Wichita State use what's called Blackboard for all of their classes. So you may have some, if you're taking other classes, they may post things on Blackboard. Um, maybe readings or um, I may even post our slides later at the end if you guys are interested. Um, this may be a way for me to post those and then you can check them that way. And so you click on the little Blackboard icon same thing, you put your MyWSU ID and your password, whatever password you set up. And then you click on My Courses. And then it will take you to a page where it will show you um, what courses you're taking. So any, if you're taking other lifelong learning courses, those will show up too. Um, and if you're not, if it's just this one, it'll be information on that. So that's just kind of, and, and I know these, these slides are difficult to see from where you are. Um, maybe they're easier online, but um, if you kind of get on there and play around with it, it's, they're fairly simple to set up. And if you have trouble, you can um, contact us and we'll help you. So this is a class outline um, of what we're gonna be doing today and the next three weeks. So today is basically going to be an introductory class. We're just um, gonna kind of talk about some history. We're gonna talk about history of collections, kind of how people started collecting and passing down things. And we're gonna talk about um, how we're gonna set up the rest of the, um, the course. Next week, is how to care for photos, documents, books, and newspapers. And I lumped all of those together because they're basic, because they're paper. They're basically flat things and they, they take a, a similar amount of care. 
So I kind of put all those together. And then um, September 24th, we'll be talking about textiles. And in textiles, I'm including clothing, quilts, um, military uniforms, all of those things that you might have. And then the last class will sort of be a kind of be our catch-all of, of everything maybe that we missed, but also we're going to talk about oral histories and writing down your stories. And I have an example of one that I'm going to show you um, of a gentleman from Augusta that um, and an oral history project that we did a few years ago, and we'll talk about that. And also we're going to talk about conservators because sometimes you have things that um, are so damaged or things that need to be repaired and you shouldn't do them yourself and you shouldn't let your friend do them. You need to hire a professional. And so we'll talk a little bit about that and I'll give you some resources for that. So this is how the class schedule um, will be and I will announce our break um, every time and, and then our online students will know as well um, when we'll be taking a break. But I will talk for about 45 minutes or so. We'll take a 10 minute restroom break. The rest of the class, we will talk about, you eat, You all have readings that you've picked up. If you didn't, please pick those up before you go. Some of those are just gonna be tips on, you know, how to care for newspapers, how to take care of, you know, certain things. Um, and those are just for you to have, maybe keep in a binder, or keep in a folder. But each week we'll have an article that we will discuss and next week's is about how do you know, how do you decide who to give your heirlooms to? What are some, what are some things? And we won't spend a lot of time on it, but I do want you guys to read it and then um, come back with some discussion. And those of you online, if you have comments to make, email them to Lifelong Learning and um, they will get them to me and we can address those. So, cause I wanna include you in this too. Um, on the uh, 24th, we're going to talk about, since um, we're kind of talking about textiles, um, there's an article about Civil War Underground Railroad quilts and about some of the symbols that were used on those quilts to signal people in the Underground Railroads. So we're going to talk about that just briefly. Um, it's an interesting article. And then the last one will be about um, oral histories, and we'll talk about that. And the second half of class will also be, um, I'll always leave time for questions. If you've got questions, write them down so you remember. Um, we can talk about those. And then the best part is we're going to do an heirloom show and tell. So that's where you can bring your items and you can tell us about them. And you will need to go up to the microphone for that. So um, you can bring items, tell us who they belong to, how old are they, are there any stories attached to it, or maybe it's an heirloom that you're starting that you are going to pass down to your children or your grandchildren. So, and if it's something that you do not feel that you want to bring to class, or maybe it's too big, um, take a picture of it. And if you send it to, um, send it to me or send it to Lifelong Learning, I think, <laughs> Yeah. We can get it um, on a slide so everyone can see it. Or if you send it to me, I can do that. If you send it to me like before Tuesday or something, I can get it on my slides. Um, and what I might do for those of you if, you, if you don't have my information, I don't know that you do, I'll send you all an email with a link to the readings and then you'll have my email. You can send it to me. Um, so send me a picture. And those of you online, Send me a picture, send me a few paragraphs about, uh, about your item, you know, just tell me about it, what it is, how old it is, who it belong to, um, what it means to you. So we're going to do that each time. So um, just bring things with you next week and that will be kind of our, that's where our audience participation comes into and I do want to include our online students as well. So send me pictures or again, if or just send me, um, information about your artifacts. Okay, so we're gonna talk about collections because this is where it all gets started. How many of you collect something? If you collect something, raise your hand and yell it out really, really loud. You in the back in the black. 
and here it's just cherish cherish teddies okay all right who else yeah m&ms m, &Ms. m, &M stuff yeah okay yeah grace livingston hill hardbacks and those take up room don't they yeah <laughs> anybody else how many of you have said um I kind of like pigs or something to someone, and then suddenly every birthday or Christmas you get that thing. I did that one time with giraffes. I just, I don't know, I told somebody I liked a giraffe and I got a little, and then for like years, I got giraffe stuff. You know, sometimes it just evolves. Anybody else? Yeah. Cottages? Ceramic cottages, yes, yes, yeah. Old books, okay, good. A lot of, we we have this innate desire to collect things. People always have, and they like to show off their collections. You know, maybe you have your collections all displayed in your house when people come over and everybody can see. I mean, people we have display cases, right? That that we can show off our collections. And, you know, we all know somebody that if you go to their house, they want to tell you about their collection. In Augusta, we have, in our museum, we have a um, kind of a revolving display case that we let people in the community show their collections. So we've had Air Force One memorabilia, Civil War memorabilia, nativity scene, Fabergé eggs, you name it. You know, and so the newspaper will come down, take a picture of the person. It's just something, they just like it. They just like to show it off and like people to see their collections. There are a lot of museums that have got started that way too. There's a railroad museum in Wellington that was started by one man's collecting railroad memorabilia. And it got so large that he started a museum. And I believe the Depression Glass Museum may have been started that way as well in Wellington. The Museum of World Treasures was started that way. Someone collecting. And let's face it, you can't pass down every collection, right? You, you just can't. People can't take those on in their own home. So um, the Museum of World Treasures was started by Dr. Kardatsky, who traveled the world, and he would bring these things back and decided to start a museum. And a lot of our small town historical museums were also started that way. People that collected things, that had things of historical value in town, and maybe there were things that they didn't want to pass down to their ancestors, maybe there was no one that wanted to take them, or maybe they just felt like they could contribute to history better if they were in the museums. That's a lot of how our museums got started, which is what we're gonna talk about today. Museums, yes, but also how our collections, how we started collecting and how we started um, passing on those things to our heirs and kind of how museums got started, but it's all gonna work into our collecting our heirlooms. Have to have a little bit of history to get going. So I use this in my class, and it's just an interesting thing to think about why we collect and how people started to collect. This is um, Dr. Alma Whitland. She's a historian, but she writes a lot about museums, and she writes a lot about collecting and studying about collecting and why people collect and how, what kinds of different collections are there. And so she narrowed these down to six different types. And the one, economic hoard. So think about a pirate's treasure. Think about in biblical times when nations would, you know, go to another city and take over that city and they would take the gold and the silver and the jewels and they would take them back to their treasury or whatever. Um, Vikings, you know, we think about the pillaging and taking of a city, those an economic hoard. Social prestige, things that um, like paintings or sculptures or something of value, something of monetary importance that would show off one's status in society. And that would be a social, social prestige. 
museum, or I'm sorry, magic collections. Magic collections would be bones of ancestors, for example, in some cultures where they would have an ancestor worship and they would um, keep the bones of the ancestors and that would be the heirloom that they would pass down to the next generation. So everyone's going to get grandpa at some time or something. So that would be a magic collection or a skull of an enemy um, from headhunting cultures. That would be, and it could also be social prestige depending on the culture, that sort of thing. Collections as expressions of group loyalty would be like um, trophies, maybe the trophy case at the high school or your chief's memorabilia or royals or something like that. Collections of a means of emotional experience. And this is where our most of our heirlooms come into play. It's something that connects us. It's something that's emotional that we have an attachment to. It could even just be um, like the, the teddy, teddy bears. It could be something that you just are interested in. Maybe you collect seashells to all the beaches that you go to or souvenirs or the books that you like, just things that you like. That could be an emotional um, collections of means of emotional experience. But this is mostly where our heirlooms, but also our heirlooms fall in social prestige as we're going to see as we get into your talking about um, collecting in Europe early on and um, how that became and passing those heirlooms on all became part of um, social prestige. And then collections as means as curiosity and inquiry. So this is something that um, we talk about in the in museum world as you know oddities or things that are just bizarre. If you can think of a museum, I've used the term loosely, but maybe a place in the United States where you can go see weird things and oddities. Can you think of what that's called? Ripley's Believe It or Not. Exactly. That's the first thing. My kid, we've been to every Ripley's Believe It or Not, everywhere we've been. Um, they've always loved those. But yeah, that's the kind of thing. And people are interested in it. People pay a lot of money to go see, you know, the nail that was driven into the two by four during a tornado or whatever, you know, interesting things like that. The word museum comes from the Greek word museion and refers to a temple dedicated to the muses, nine young goddesses who watch out for welfare and basic categories of Greek artistic culture, including the epic, music, love, poetry, oration, history, tragedy, comedy, dance, and astronomy. So one of the, the first um, museums and rounds of collecting really happened in Alexandria, Egypt by Alexander the Great's half-brother, Ptolemy I. And Ptolemy um, was able, he, after Alexander died, Alexander the Great died, he took um, parts of Egypt and adjoining parts of North Africa. He made Alexandria his capital, and he started uh, really what's considered the first museum and liberal arts college there. And it was the Museum. And young men would come and stay there. And it was focused on uh, research and um, scholarly research and scholarly collections, things like music and art and science and humanities, all of those things. The Alexandria uh, Library was started during this time as well. And the descendants of Ptolemy kept this going for hundreds of years. Alexandria was a leading, um, a leading place for Western civilization for, um, for knowledge for years and years. So we're going to move on into Europe, and this is where our social prestige takes over. So people were collecting paintings. They were collecting um, sculptures and tapestries and silver and china and all these things and they were passing these on to their ancestors they were passing these on to their heirs because they would inherit the entire estate and everything that came with it and there were things that they would pass out to certain maybe family members but 
um, whoever the, the main heir was would get the whole estate, would get everything there was. And so eventually, um, you know, they would set up, they would have amassed so many things and they were so concerned about the social prestige that they started having what they called Wunderkammers or these cabinets where they would invite people to come and see their things and ooh and ah and just see how wonderful and wealthy and beautiful their things were and admire them. This is kind of the still idea of how we like to show our collections. Now, this was more of a social prestige. There may have been some emotional um, things, too, associated with that, but it was mostly about prestige. Albrecht, the Duke of Bavaria, though, he liked to collect weird things because he liked to see the reaction of his visitors when they would come to his castle and they would see the two-headed calf or they would see the giant stuffed elephant, like an actual elephant that was stuffed. They would see that and they were just ooh and ah over it. An egg within an egg. He claimed to have manna that fell from heaven. You know, and people would come and they would see these things. Now, were those things he could pass on to his heirs? Probably not, but that wasn't why he was doing it. He was doing it just for the wow factor. And then modern day oddity collections, we already talked about that a little bit with Ripley's. Now the British Museum was not the oldest museum in Europe, but it is one of the first museums that was open to the public and by the public, I mean rich people. And so um, what happened was these aristocracy and the royal families were, amassing so much of the paintings and the sculptures and the tapestries and all these things, they could not pass them all down to their ancestors. And so who gets these things? Well, a lot of museums in Europe were started from these things that, um, that the heirs couldn't take or just kind of the overflow of the castles, if you can imagine. And so a lot of those museums were started this way and the British Museum is one of those. The British Museum, um, started being open to the public so that people could come and view these things. But again, it was just, it was very limited. They would only allow 30 people a day. You had to make a reservation and it was only 15 people at a time and you had two hours. Now, I don't know what they're doing in the British Museum today, but it might be similar as far as your reservations. But I would imagine they're allowing more than 30 people in a day. Um, Ernest Budge, this has nothing to do with heirlooms. It's just a fun little story that I tell in my class. Ernest Budge was a curator of Egyptian art in 1887 for the British Museum. Now, back then, museums did not have um, strict collections policies as we do now, and ethics were a little more relaxed in collecting. And which the British Museum is still, um, they're still suffering the consequences of this today as some of these things that were acquired illegally or allegedly illegally. So Ernest Budge was known to um, buy Egyptian artifacts off the black market from Tomb Raiders. And he heard that the Book of Ani was available, the Book of the Dead was going to be available. And so he made plans to go to Egypt. There was also a Frenchman who was working for the Egyptian government in antiquities. And he was um, trying to keep this from happening, trying to keep items from being sold on the black market. He also knew about Ernest's reputation. So he went to Egypt too. And he met Ernest with these guys, uh, the Tomb Raiders and the Book of the Dead. He arrested Ernest, put him in jail, took the Book of the Dead, put it in a bank vault and sealed it up. Well, Ernest had friends in low places and they were able to go in with dynamite, blow a hole out of the wall, get the Book of the Dead and take it back to London where it's still there to this day. So that's just a side story, it really doesn't have anything to do with the heirlooms, but and then the French Revolution created the first public museum in France. What do you think that was? The Louvre. Yeah, the Louvre. In the United States, um, in 1748, the Charleston Library Society was a group of young 
English men who wanted to have the same kinds of things that they had in England, the same kinds of literature and opportunities. And so they developed this group and they also started doing research and they decided, you know, it's great to bring in things from England, but there's, there's things in, in our natural world around Charleston that's really interesting. And so they started to collect those things and those collections turned into the first museum in the United States. Charleston, South Carolina, yes. Uh, the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts is the nation's oldest art museum. Um, they had this uh, exhibit from Benjamin West. They also had a plaster cast of nudes from the Louvre and they had a special ladies day because it wasn't proper for men and women to, be, to view the nudes together. So they had a special time for the ladies to come. And then we have P.T. Barnum, who added showmanship to his, by adding live curiosities. So he was the king of the oddities, right? He liked to have the unusual, the awe-inspiring. But he started having, um, he started putting live people on display, so to speak. And in the freak shows. And so there were a lot of people with physical abnormalities that science just didn't understand. And they, um, he kind of started to amass this group of people and put them in these freak shows and got a lot of money because people wanted to see them. But there were also people that were criticizing him because he was exploiting these people. But the people, when they were interviewed, said that really, they were thankful to him because they gave them jobs and they couldn't find jobs anywhere else. Nobody else would give them jobs. But this is something that kind of started um, these live collections that didn't end well. And we see that with the World's Fairs. Um, the World's Fairs showcase the newest, the most technologically advanced items of the time. And these buildings would be erected to hold, they would bring in paintings from Europe, they would bring in all these collections and all of these technologically advanced things. And then after the World's Fair was over, what happened? They're just there. So a lot of our museums started from the World's Fairs. But also, and this is, I won't go into this, this is something we talk about in um, class, but this was after the um, Spanish-American War, where America was kind of starting to get interested in what was going on in the Philippines. And they started sending people over to study these tribes that were in the remote jungles of the Philippines. And they started to bring back these people and set them up into live exhibits. And they called them the Philippine reservations and they would expect them to sort of just perform their rituals and things that they would perform in the Philippines, just on a regular basis, but they had to do this all the time on a schedule. And anyway, um, it ended up not turning out well. Let's put it that way. <laughs> all right. I think um, right now, since it's about, oh, well, let's see. Oh, it's only 1.33. Okay. To keep track of my time here. All right. So, what is an heirloom? A valuable object that has belonged to a family for several generations. And that value does not have to be monetary. It could be. Maybe your heirlooms are valuable monetarily, but the value lies in your connection with that object and the emotional experience that you have and the connection to that family member. Why are heirlooms so important? Why do we care? People have been collecting since the beginning of times. Items get passed down, items of importance. An object becomes important when it ties us to a loved one. It could even be someone we've never met. Maybe you have something that belonged to, you know, a great, great grandparent that you've never even met, but you have this object and there's something about that that ties us, that connects us to it. Those objects become part of our roots, part of our history. When you know the history of something, whether it's a town, whether it's a building, whether it's an object, whether it's a person, when you know that history, you feel a connection to it. 
And so that's what our heirlooms do. They connect us to something, to a memory. They connect us to our roots. They connect us to our past. So here's a list of the top 10 common family heirlooms. How many of you have heirlooms that fit into that category? Most of you. How many of you have something that is totally different? Do you have something that doesn't? Yeah. What do you have? Do you have something that's different? Yeah. Okay, I can't I can't hear you with your mask. Sorry. Oh, okay, yes. Okay, so textiles other than quilts and okay, yeah. Yes. Maternity dress, mother of your grandfather. Oh, that's unusual. You may have to send a picture. I don't want you to bring it. <laughs> you send us a picture. <laughs> yeah. A saddle. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, these are the most common, but I mean, they can be anything. I mean, sometimes even cars get passed down, you know. Um, it could be even farm machinery. There's all kinds of things. So why do we care? Why do we want to preserve our family heirlooms? Well, because we want them to last, right? We want them to continue to be able to be passed down. Um, there's things that deteriorate naturally. We're going to talk about this next week. I'm going to talk about... Um, the kinds of materials that you need to use to store your objects, things that can help stop that deterioration, because things like paper naturally deteriorates, but we can stop it. When we get things donated to the museum, we want to take it, whatever condition it's in, we don't want it to deteriorate anymore. I mean, there's some things, damage is done. You know, and, and there's there's things that can't, it's already been damaged, it's already been water damaged, whatever. There's things that we can't do, but we can stop it from continuing to deteriorate. And so, um, and that's why we want to, you know, to learn to take care of our artifacts, learn to take care of our things that are important to us. And you're going to get in your readings, I'm going to give you tips. And the Library of Congress is a great resource where a lot of these things are coming from. Um, the Smithsonian. And then there's other things too, resources that um, you will get in your readings. And again, if you have not picked those up, um, they're for you, ready for you at the back table. So get those maybe at break or before you leave. And those of you online, um, you can check your Dropbox for those. And I'm also going to talk about supplies, supplies that you can use. I'm going to talk about where you can get supplies. I'll bring some catalogs for you to look at. There's also ways, there are some archival supplies that are pricey, but there's also things that you can do that are very inexpensive. And so we'll talk about both of those things and even some things that you can make um, for your objects. All right, so what's the story? So when someone donates an item to the museum, we wanna know the story. Where did it come from? Who did it belong to? How old is it? In, in our museum, since we get things from all over the world, we wanna know what, what culture is it from? Some cases we have an artist. So we have a lot of things from the Osmot people in Papua New Guinea. And we, sometimes we know who carved the piece or we know who the weaver was um, on a piece from Guatemala. Now we don't always, but sometimes we do. We just wanna know as much information as we can. It makes a difference on when we're exhibiting something. It also makes a difference on how we connect with that object. And um, it just, it makes it so much more interesting for exhibit. And I'm gonna give you an example. But if you, 
write down the stories. You may know the stories to your heirlooms, to your pieces, like the maternal wedding dress of your grandfather's mother, if I got that right. Something like that. <laughs> Maternity dress. Um, that is information that needs to be passed down because that could be information that could be lost. You know, if so, writing things down, even connecting it to those pieces so that your ancestors, so that your, your grandchildren, your great grandchildren, they know about this because once you're gone, those stories are gone. And maybe you have things that you don't know um, about. How many of you looked at old photographs and you're like, I don't know who this person is. I know that's grandma but I don't know who's with grandma, you know? And it's like, or maybe you don't know who they are at all. And then you don't have a connection to it. You don't really care anymore. You know, we see photos all the time in antique stores and estate sales because nobody knows who they are. Right. So write those things down, right. So that people know who they are, you know, who they are, but when someone is looking through your things someday, will they know who they are? Write your stories down about your items so that people know. How many of you have done genealogy? Like on Ancestry? Yeah. How many of you have found something that you, or maybe you thought was always true, and then you did research and found out that wasn't true at all? Has you ever found any stories like that? Yeah. So I... Um, have done a little bit of that also. And um, my mother always said her family, her father's family was from Wales. And so she always thought, I'm from Wales, you know, she has a Welsh background. And so I did some um, research and did some genealogy on ancestry and found out that that's not where they were from at all. They were from Germany. But when they came here, they settled in New Wales Pennsylvania. So somehow those stories get passed down and things change, right? Things change. So that's why it's important to write those things down. It's like history. It's how we know history, right? Someone's written it down. Because if you're just telling oral histories are great and you should record oral histories, but you should also write things down. So, um, and my great, great grandfather has a wonderful story about you know, leaving his childhood home and coming West. And it's really, it's really like a wild West movie. It's amazing. But he wrote it all down. And so we have his, um, we have his account of what happened. So that's pretty amazing. So we're going to talk about that a little bit more too, but I do want to um, show you an item and I use this for my class just to show you the importance of stories. And I have to get out my gloves. So this item is from the Augusta Historical Museum, and it's a wooden spoon. And it's carved from one piece of wood, but there's really nothing special about it, right? If you're just looking, if you were in a museum and the label said wooden spoon, 1874, you'd be like, oh, that's old, and then move on, right? Or maybe you wanted to give this wooden spoon to your granddaughter and she's like, I'm going to just throw this in a box somewhere. I don't care. Right. But when you know the story attached to this wooden spoon, it becomes much, much more than just a wooden spoon. How many of you know what happened? There was an event that happened in and throughout the Great Plains, including Kansas in 1874. Anybody know what that is? Grasshopper. Oh, good. You got it right on. Grasshoppers. Yes. So the settlers would talk about this black cloud in the distance and they thought it was rain clouds. And so they were excited because, you know, they always needed rain in the Great Plains. But as the cloud started to get closer, it was making noise. It was buzzing and it wasn't a cloud at all. It was thousands and thousands of grasshoppers which were Rocky Mountain locusts, a form of Rocky Mountain lo locusts that are extinct. But the grasshoppers were devastating. They ate everything in sight. They ate all the crops. 
They ate the clothes that were hanging out on the line. They ate curtains. They even ate kitchen utensils. They ate everything. And so this was from a family that lived in rural Kansas, a farm family that suffered through the grasshopper invasion. And the man felt so bad for his wife and the things that she lost, even though he lost his crops, their crops, that he went out to the barn and they had a feeding trough that was still intact. And he carved the spoon from that feeding trough. So now it's much more than a wooden spoon, right? It ties us to a historical event and it ties us to people that actually lived. And if you can imagine, those were your family members. Now, the family that donated this to Augusta, I don't know if they just didn't have anyone to pass it on to, if anyone was interested, but they felt like it was historically significant and wanted to donate it to the museum. And so, but those are the kinds of stories that mean something to our family members because they tie us to those people, even if you've never met them. That's why it's so important to include your stories. So we are gonna take about a 10 minute break and we're gonna finish up and we're gonna talk about some interesting family heirloom stories. And I brought a show and tell of my own. So we'll go ahead and, and pause for 10 minutes.
Never mind. <laughs> okay, we're going to go ahead and resume our session here. I do have a couple of questions from our online students, and um, basically I'm going to tell them they're going to have to wait, but one of them is, where can I get a painting or print cleaned? We're gonna, I'm gonna give you some resources. If you can hang on, I will give you some resources for conservators because yes, a painting is something you definitely do not wanna try to clean yourself. So I will give you a resource that's uh, fairly close by. It's um, in Nebraska, but I wanna give you a resource for that. There may be some others too um, that might be helpful. Um, the other question was, we collect bronzes passed on to us from several sources. How do we clean those? Hang on to that one too. I'm going to give you some resources on how to clean bronzes. And there's some, some simple kind of home remedy type of cleaners that you can use. And I will share those um, with you next time if you can hang on to those. That means you have to tune in next time and come back and I'll give you some answers that will help with that. All right, I do want to finish up here kind of talking about some family heirlooms that are really have interesting stories to them. And this one is a 200 year old recipe and housekeeping book. And this was a guy, this was from England and a guy named Bob Watson. And he bought this housekeeping book at a sale or they call them car boots there, but they have sales out of the trunk of their cars. And he bought this um, housekeeping book and it was dated from 1811. And they would have how, these housekeeping manuals that for to how to you know take care of these large estates, and they would have be full of recipes and all kinds of things to help manage this estate. And so he bought this; he thought it was interesting. And the handwriting changes throughout about halfway through the book. The books were commonly passed down from mother to daughter. And he searched and searched for, this was 1990s, okay? So um, just doing a Google search was not like it is now. So he had to search and, and just kind of kept hitting dead ends on, he wanted to find the family that this belonged to. And so finally, he found a name associated with the book and he found a will. And the will listed even more names. It kind of kept leading him. One thing would lead him to another part of the um, treasure hunts, kind of. And so um, it led him to the town of Deddington, Oxfordshire. And so he talked to somebody at their historical society. And um, they constructed, they showed him the kind of a, a, a genealogy of this family. And he found the oldest living relative, Colin Peel, who is the younger man in this picture. And so by this time, Bob was 90 years old. He'd been searching for a long time, but he finally found um, the relative and he was so happy to have this heirloom that he didn't even know anything about that connected him with family members he had never met. But it was something that his ancestors could cherish now. This is a 120 year old wedding dress. On October 17th, 2015, Abigail Kingston was the 11th bride to wear this 120th, 20 year old wedding dress. It was first worn by her great, great grandmother, Mary Lowry Warren in 1895. The tradition took a few years to get started, about 50 for that matter, because you know, the, the daughters and granddaughters, they didn't want to wear the old wedding dress, you know, and in the twenties, they wanted a flapper style dress. And, you know, so it took a while for this to catch on. And so finally there was a granddaughter in 1946 that chose to wear the dress. So when Abigail learned about this dress, it took her a while to hunt it down because it had passed from to cousins and aunts and, you know, all over the place. And then when she got it, 
it was yellowed. It was full of tears. It had not been taken care of. And it took 200 hours of painstaking expert restoration. And she, matter of fact, she wore it for the wedding ceremony and then changed after because it was so fragile. And the, uh, there were some alterations that took place throughout the years. If you can imagine, the, um, the great-great-grandmother had an 18-inch waist. And so most of the other women did not. And so things like, and Abigail was 5'10", and her great-great-grandmother was much shorter. So, and there were all kinds of, there were, um, they had added like big poofy sleeves in the 80s. And it, in this article, they showed all the different ways that this dress had been altered. So Abigail wanted to, um, to make it look as much like the original as she could. So, and then this is something that she's passing down, hopefully to her daughter or granddaughter. And sometimes our heirlooms tie us to memories that maybe aren't so great, but they hold emotional significance and importance to us anyway. And sometimes they're not anything that you would think anybody would want. Such as a lice comb. The writer of the article says, when my daughter was born, my mother gave me a comb that my grandmother Ella had given her. The comb, it turned out, had a great history attached to it. My mother first found the comb in my grandmother's jewelry box when she was a teenager, and her questions about it were answered quickly and clinically. She had kept the lice comb with her in a Nazi slave labor camp. And so it goes on talking about her grandmother and um, her family was sent to Treblinka. They died in the concentration camp. She was sent to a ghetto. She had this lice comb and she had her little brother. Those were her two cherished possessions. And the lice comb, because it was provided, but the only comfort she had was to get rid of this lice. And so she hung on to that and her brother didn't survive. She held on to this lice comb. So there were memories attached to it that weren't pleasant memories, but yet it was a source of comfort and just a, it was something that she felt was important to remember and to hang on to all those years. This was a, um, picture of, of her in later years in New York. And then there's a 170-year-old quilt. Sometimes when people pass away and there's no heirs to give things to, or there's sometimes estates are given to historical societies, and that's what happened here. But there was somebody that knew the story of this quilt. And um, when Frances Garner Kinnear died in 1982, her home and much of its contents were donated to the Hadley Lake Lucerne Historical Society in Lake Lucerne, New York. Um, Kinnear's grandmother, Jane Greenway, finished the quilt January 15th, 1845, when she was 13 years old in Armagh, Ireland. Not long afterwards, young Jane boarded a ship to Australia to visit friends, bringing with her the white quilt adorned with red and blue applique and hand crocheted lace trim. In Australia, the girl met and married Edward Garner, an American on a mining expedition, said David Cranston, past president of the Historical Society. They boarded a ship from Sydney to England with their three young children for a 93-day miserable journey. And then they traveled to the United States and settled in Lake Lucerne. All the while, Jane Greenway Garner held on to that quilt. And her grandmother was gone. Kinnear cherished the family quilt. Um, it was so precious to her. I wish Fran had talked about the person, but her grandmother died just four years after she was born. And I think this is a really interesting quote. Sometimes the only way to get to know the women of the household is through their work. So when we have those, those um, quilts passed down or needlework or, you know, some kind of sewing, that was so important, getting to know the women of the household.
refugee heirlooms, if you had to leave your home in a hurry, what would you take with you? What would be important to you? You know, there's people all over the world today that are having to do that. But this, this we're talking about World War II. Um, you know, the Nazis would go in and they would take valuable um, artwork from people. They would take them off the walls. They would take their um, figurines, their anything they had that was of value. We know that Hitler had the whole art heist going on. Um, and some of these have been returned through the years to people, but a lot of them weren't. And this is a picture that was very valuable to this, um, this woman, Isabel Rosenbaum. She kept this picture. She cut out some of the Hebrew inscriptions at the top for safety reasons. So she could take this with her. Um, and it goes on to kind of talk about her uh, experience throughout the war and being in the concentration camps and, and the Nazis coming and taking her family. And she kept this picture with her. This also um, inspired one of her family members to start a um, sort of an exhibit about re refugee items that the Jewish people took with them and kind of putting these together in an exhibit. This was another refugee item. This was also World War II. Um, this, is, this trunk was um, some... It says, my grandmother, father, and uncle were deported from eastern Poland to Siberia in early 1940. The uh, Nazis came, and they gave my grandmother 30 minutes to pack for a journey. Where are we going? You'll find out soon enough, was the reply. Amazingly, she managed to, um, to get the Soviets to load a Singer sewing machine on the cattle truck along with ball gowns. And those came a lifesaver in the camp because she was able to transform those ball gowns into wedding dresses for people that were getting married in exchange for food. And this trunk, without the sewing machine, traveled with her um, and was passed on to one of her ancestors who picked it up. And the sewing machine was long gone, but the trunk still remains. Someone still has that. And then the next one, sometimes we don't know why people pass on things. This, this woman um, in this article said, you know, this is, again, was a refugee item. And this mortar and pestle was passed on from mother to daughter. Why? Don't know. Maybe it was somebody that was involved in cooking and they could um, ground the spices and things like that. But it was something that she didn't really know why it was passed down, but she just knew it was important. And she kept it because it was a connection to her, her family. It was a connection to her legacy. All right, so you have these, so it's not really, you can't see those anyway on the screen, that's okay. Those are some of the readings. Next week we'll talk about the estate affairs, how to determine what keeps a loved one's heirloom, who keeps it, um, and maybe some ideas we can share with each other. And then we have show and tell, and I have an item, and I think some of you may have brought something, but I will share mine, and then I will open it up if you would like to come up and share, and if you did not bring something today because you didn't know, and that's totally fine, bring something next week. You will need to come up to the microphone. You won't be able to touch the microphone um, but you can come up to the microphone so that um, people can hear you and they can see you online. Those of you online, send me emails of your family heirlooms that you'd like for me to, um, to talk about. And I will also give, don't worry, the questions that were asked today, I will give you answers for those. But in this um, notebook... I have probably about 10 of these notebooks. Now this, this heirloom, there's, it's not worth anything. It's not worth any money at all, but it's valuable to me because it's full of poetry that was written by my grandmother. And she was a poet. She um, was in the Kansas Authors Club for years and years, she wrote, she's written her whole life. She even wrote for Hallmark for a little bit early on. 
She's um, judged poetry contests. She's won all kinds of different contests and she's taught poetry classes. And so she has um, these notebooks and notebooks full of poetry. And when I was little, I would spend the night with her and we would read poems because she has, she has them all, they're very organized. She has them all by sections, type of poetry, villanelles, sonnets, uh, limericks, haiku, um, poems for children, poems, light verse, poems for uh, religious poems, poems for Christmas, all these kinds of things. And she has poems that she wrote about me when I was little and my kids and my mother when she was little. So she would read those to me. So it, you know, these are priceless to me. And, um, and we're going to talk next week about what I should be doing with them. So we're, <laughs> we're all learning together. Um, but they have, she changed, she has her, um, Hand, they're all typed, like on a typewriter, you know. But she ha also has her notes because she, a poem was never finished. So she has her revisions. She has the dates that she entered into a contest, what she, if she won and what she won. Um, so, and when it, where it was published. And it probably, her notebooks, I would say, start in the early 60s and go up to about maybe, I don't know, 2008, somewhere around there, maybe 2007. She died, she passed away in 2010. So for the last few years, she wasn't writing, but, um, but they're treasures to me. She writes about the moon landing, you know, just, and, and when I read them, I feel a connection to her, you know? So, um, so the, this is my early, which I know you can't see it because it's just a binder, but you have to trust me that It's full of poetry. <laughs> Is there anybody that has something they want to share? Okay. If you would bring it and you'll, I know you'll need to come stand over here and try not to touch the microphone. And maybe say, you can take your mask off when you talk in the microphone. And if you would say your name too, and then um, what you have. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Jody, skill woman. And I brought a rug that I inherited a textile, I guess I, shouldn't say that it's rug because I don't exactly know that, but um, a, rug, a textile that I inherited, which is from Istanbul, Turkey, I inherited it through my mother, and I don't really know the story. However, um, my mother was in an international club in college at the University of Texas at Austin, this would have been approximately 1940, 42. And she had a very dear friend, a man who was from Turkey. So I am guessing that she got this textile through this young man. And I do not know if it was in his family. Like either full part of it. Sure, that would be wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, we'll figure it out. <laughs> At any rate, it is a beautiful wool textile, and um, it is woven in a style that I would call a, a textile style, where the shift in colors has happened. There is a little slit with, they had the different shuttles going uh, with different colors. At any rate, so I'm hoping to be able to hang this for display appropriately in a way that won't damage it. And I was um, able to get some tips from our instructor because I don't know that I will be here on the textile day. Um, anyway, 
it's beautiful. So I'm second generation in possession of this textile in my family. My name is Marty Hammond. I was looking through the uh, handouts that we got, except it was online earlier this morning. <laughs> Didn't realize that it was going to be a show and share. But when I saw the item on the slide, I couldn't <laughs> help but bring. I am not the person who is that who had that photo. This just happens to be. I think an identical <laughs> yes. slide or item. Yeah. As far as I know, this came uh, that it belonged to my great great grandmother. <laughs> Whether it came from the old country, I don't know. But I just thought it was so coincidental. Yeah, it is. I mean, it looks just like it. Yeah. So. But it's <laughs> um, well, at the time it was part of Germany, um, but it was Czechoslovakia. Thank you. Hello, my name is Carl Koenig. I uh, came to this class to learn about conserving old documents which have been mistreated. Um, my mother organized things beautifully. She did a lot of family research, but she used these uh, sticky photo albums. This one has things from my mother's aunt. She got as far as sixth grade, then went to a church school to learn nursing. This is in Germany. She was a nurse helping the German army during the First World War. So one of the things here is a certificate of commendation from the Prince of Baden for her service in the war and a couple of wartime pictures. And then on the other side, a handwritten letter which I've only scanned a little bit to try to figure out what the German is, but near as I can tell, it uh, is like a letter saying that uh, she was qualified as a nurse. Great. She then came to the U.S. after the First World War with my mother and grandmother. Great. Thank you. Is there anybody else? All right. Well, that is all we have today. That's going to conclude um, our first session. So if you have any questions or comments or things and you want to email me, that is perfectly fine. And then um, also those of you online, if you would email me, um, continue to email questions. And if you have um, heirlooms you want to share, email those to me too, some pictures. So that is all I have today. Oh, yes. My email, that my email personally, the lifelong learning. You can do lifelong learning at wichita.edu. So it's lifelong learning, all one, all one word. Let me go back to that. Uh, let's see. There, there it is. Oh, no, it's not. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> I can see it. Why can't you? <laughs> I went too far. It's it's my fault. But yeah, it's lifelong learning at wichita.edu. Yeah. All right. And we will see you next week. <laughs>